Bye, everybody. Wait, um, one minute for everybody to join the call as we've got quite a lot of people coming on. So bear with us whilst we wait for everybody to log in. Thank you. Going live in 15 minutes, just waiting for everybody to come on the call. Good morning. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Prince's Trust Diversity and Inclusion live talk. In the next hour, you will hear from our truly inspiring panelists to discuss diversity and disability in the workplace. My name is Dagmar Bennett and I work for the innovation team in the Prince's Trust. Over a year ago, I was running a studio business in East London and it got turned into flats. I decided I want to change my career. So I started looking for jobs, a proper nine to five job, whereas before that I was freelance and had run my own business. So I was applying for lots of jobs online and I really struggled to get into work. Despite having a first in my degree, starting a business and lots of freelance experience, I really struggled to get into employment. I found myself as an unemployed young person receiving help from the Prince's Trust. I went to them and I started the Enterprise course, which is an amazing um, platform where you learn how to start your own business from start to beginning. And I then attended an event called Get Hired. So for those of you that don't know, Get Hired is a one day event, which is now an online program. And at the time, this completely, like completely, completely <laughs> eradicated the barriers that I was facing at that time. I walked away from that event having had four successful job, four successful interviews and two job offers. To this day, my manager has still not to have seen my CV. I've now been successfully employed with the Prince's Trust for over a year. It's my first ever office job and I'm leading on the first Prince's Trust diversity and inclusion talks. So for those of you that are young people that are out there who are listening, I know exactly how you feel. Please do not give up. Reach out to the Prince's Trust and get support. It's completely free. The team are amazing. They're completely non-judgmental and friendly. So I wanted to start these live talks to make a change to young people's lives. I believe if we create economic justice for the next generation, then we can create a more inclusive and equal workforce. Yes, we need to educate ourselves. Yes, we need to have open conversations, but most of all, we need to take measurable actions to make some real change in our companies and the world of work. So I urge the audience today, whether you're a young person, a freelancer or a business, to please take some pen and paper and write down some key nuggets of knowledge that you're going to hear from our amazing panelists today. Bring up these nuggets of knowledge in your next work meetings or with your friends and try and implement those changes within your world of work. Please support me on my journey because your opportunities really do change young lives. So throughout this talk, we, you have the opportunity to put anything, any comments or any Q&As on the right hand corner. So please feel free to do that. We will also be recording this talk and putting it live on YouTube with subtitles on it. So for those of you that need that, we will email that to you after the talk. The Prince's Trust is the largest youth charity in the UK. We support thousands of young people aged 11 to 30 to help them get into employment. The Prince's Trust vision is that every young person should have the chance to succeed, to start something with confidence, courses and career. To celebrate the Manchester Centre reopening for face-to-face -face delivery, we want to thank, thank the Future Workforce Fund as this is a groundbreaking two year initiative that tests innovative ways of delivering support for young people in Greater Manchester. So thank you to the Future Workforce Fund 
which aims to transform young lives in Greater Manchester. So I'm going to set the scene a little bit. We're talking about disability in the workplace today. So what do we mean when we're talking about disability? There are many definitions of disability and for today we will be referring to the Government Statistical Service Harmonise Core Definition. This identifies disabled as a person who has a physical or mental health condition or illness that has lasted or is expected to last 12 months or more that reduces their ability to carry out day to day activities. Person with disabilities refers to anyone who is disadvantaged by the way in which the wider environment interacts with their impairment or long term health problem. We are mindful that some people may not choose to use this language of disability and will never do so. So I'm going to set the scene for the barriers that some disabled people face getting into work. Pre COVID-19, disabled people were paid on average 15.3% less than non-disabled people. During lockdown, the effects on disabled people's mental health have resulted in more feelings of loneliness. The cause of this is likely be to be due to the fact that 52.7% of disabled people are more likely to report having self-isolated because of COVID-19. Negative attitudes towards disabled people are still far too common in our society. Disabled people have said that these negative attitudes represent one of the most significant barriers to them living the life they choose. So I'm now set the scene. That's those are the facts. Thank you for bearing with me on those facts. So we've got the unemployment pay gap, the effects of COVID-19 and the prejudices towards disabled people. So today we're going to talk about addressing those solutions, addressing those issues and how we can come up with solutions. So to the part that we've all been waiting for, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists. Adam, would you like to introduce yourself first? Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Pearson. I am a TV presenter, actor and disability advocate and campaigner, which means I go into institutions such as schools and talk about disability, disfigurement, inclusivity, body image and body confidence. I also go into big corporates and talk about um, attitudes, access, accessibility and language in terms of successfully hiring disabled people and making that shift from putting disabled people in jobs to placing disabled talent in careers. Thank you. And Philippa, would you like to go next, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Philippa. I currently work at Facebook in the recruiting team and I recruit across EMEA, so um, various different teams within that. And I want to thank the Princess Trust for inviting me to be part of this conversation and creating that safe space to do it. Uh, it's nice to get dressed out of anything that isn't gym wear for once, um, but it's a, a really kind of passionate topic for me because um, essentially I'm a statistic. Uh, 1, 1.3 billion people uh, across the world live with some form of disability. Um, I'm proudly dyslexic. I have family members with uh, ADHD, bipolar, global learning difficulties. So I want to talk to business and help candidates through the interviews who have perhaps had a similar experiences to myself, but give them the confidence to uh, know that they can achieve what they need to achieve. And essentially, hopefully today, I'll be able to give you some of those tips to realise that um, we're not disabled, we're just differently abled, and we have just slightly different superpowers that you as a business can um, really utilise. Thank you, Philippa. And Tanika, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Tanika and I am a young black female with a disability. This may be controversial a little bit, but this is my life and I was born with sickle cell anemia and then I went on to develop multiple sclerosis when I was 21. This is something that's quite daunting as soon as you get it because your whole body shuts down and I was just thinking to myself, well, if my body's going to shut down now, what's going to happen when I get to become an elderly person? So I think for me, it's just about perseverance, having a strong mind, 
makes everything strong. Strong mind, strong everything. Having faith in yourself and friends and family to support you is what definitely got me through. And the Prince's Trust was supporting me through their different courses just to ensure that and reminds me that actually, Tanika, you are able, you're able to do anything you put your mind to and just believe in yourself. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your introductions. So, Adam, you are a successful actor who has worked with Scarlett Johansson. You've created your own TV programmes for BBC and for Channel 4, as well as a couple of weeks ago being the winner of Celebrity Mastermind. Can you tell us a bit about your journey um, and how you got to where you are now? So I I had no plans to go into the, the media. Academically, my background is in business and, and economics. I graduated from the University of Brighton in, oh, what year did I graduate? 2007. And then did a gap year afterwards to avoid top up fees. I had to pay way more if I'd done it before. And I just sort of left uni and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, graduating was all a big anti-climax. I mean, I thought I'd walk out of my last exam. They'd be playing Eye of the Tiger over the PA. Um, and an eagle would swoop down and hand me a job. And none of that happened. So there's that massive and now what moment. We've got to do a bit of self-assessment. And we often forget to do that within the, the rigours of, of academia. And so I kind of applied for a few jobs here and there, applied for a job in radio, didn't get it. And they put me in commissioning in the, the TV department and it just seemed like a really good fit. So I got there, I worked hard, I came into work, had a random chat with a random guy in a lift who turned out to be the head of TV, who, who quite liked the cut of my jib. And so he sent me to another company on like what was meant to be two weeks work experience. And then seven years later, I've got multiple documentaries and TV series and films under my belt. And it's all a case of seizing every opportunity and do, doing your best and also be, being nice to people. TV is an industry where you don't know who you're going to meet on the way up or on the way down. And so it always pays to, to be courteous and to get there early, stay there late do your job, show initiative, the, the classic things that everyone is, is told to do to do anyway. And now I'm in a situation where I can kind of pay that good fortune I've had forward. And if I if I know of people who are who are disabled, who are, who are in a situation that I was in at that age, I can fire off a few emails and say, hey, here's my friend XYZ, they're looking to do XYZ is there somewhere we can all help them out here? Thank you. And why um, why is it so important that disability is part of the diversity and inclusion conversation, Adam? I think it's important because for so long it hasn't been. Now, statistically, and this is from um, Caroline Casey's organisation, The Valuable 500, 98% of companies say they do diversity but only 4% do disability. And I'm afraid to say that if you aren't doing disability, you're not doing diversity. What you are in fact doing is some weird offshoot of diversity called diverse-ish. And I have zero time for diverse-ish. And, and why, why are you so passionate about this subject, Adam? What, where does your passion come from? Well, because I, I think I've been there. I think I've been at the, the, the wrong end of the, the proverbial stick. And the, the three main barriers to um, disability and employment from either side of the, the hiring, firing dichotomy are attitudes, accessibility and, and language. And I think we need to create a, a conversation and a landscape where both disabled people and employers can focus on ability rather than disability and stop seeing it as a burden and seeing it as an opportunity. We've got 15 million disabled people in the UK. So if disabled people in the UK were a country, they'd be the 74th largest country on the planet. We've got a global spending power of $8 trillion. And in the UK alone, 
that's a market of 250 billion and that's growing 14 percent every year so that's the potential workforce and potential um marketplace that you can operate in and 80 percent of disabled people acquire their disabilities while they're of working age and these are things that we all too often forget when we're looking at the recruitment process for disabled talent disabled candidates and so i think we need to have a good long look and reshuffle on how we discuss it how we handle it and how we implement it in in the in our wider economy and within our corporate businesses and practices i love that see it as an opportunity i love that what you were saying there adam so philippa as someone who has a successful career across europe the middle east and africa for facebook can you tell us a bit about your career path and how your dyslexia has been part of this yeah sure so um I think I've actually come to learn more about dyslexia in my working career than I ever did in my school career, which has um, been quite eye opening. So dyslexia actually affects at least one in 10 people and yet only 3% of the public believe that dyslexia is a positive trait. And I definitely was grouped within that. Um, when I think back to my schooling, I, I knew I had difficulties learning. I excelled in some kind of creative subjects, but it was harder in spellings and maths and things like that and my teachers just I'm not going to say my age but my teachers just couldn't pinpoint it back then it wasn't dyslexia wasn't really a thing it wasn't really known so whilst they raised concerns uh, it was very much a, a thing that I had to kind of deal with myself and I think that has made me really resilient I think that's probably made a lot of people resilient and that's one of the kind of key things that I take away with anyone with a disability is that we know how to hack we know how to kind of find our own solutions to get around certain challenges. So um, when I then think about how that affected me going into the workplace, I, I didn't go to university. Uh, schooling was schooling was difficult for me. It was exhausting. So the thought of going and paying a large sum of money to go to university as well was just not something I wanted to um, consider. So going into the working life, I remember a very vivid experience of speaking to a recruitment agency and without even having a conversation with them, sat in reception and asked to do a spelling test which as a, as a dyslexic person is probably the most petrifying thing you could do so i i never wanted someone to have that experience and and someone actually asked me whether i'd consider going into recruiting myself and i thought if i can give someone a positive experience of going into the workplace feeling supported having some kind of advice and that's what i want to do and actually when we think about dyslexia often the real success stories and the superpowers as I like to say um, are that you're good influencers, you are great with working with people, you're very good at problem solving, you're very creative, you're good communicators and recruitment made sense because previously I'd always focus on the things I wasn't great at so spelling, reading, memorizing facts so someone else highlighting the things that I was really great at led me into recruitment and then working with clients before I got to Facebook I guess my biggest challenge and I guess frustration is that uh, businesses want to hire quickly and with speed doesn't always come diversity and good intent um, you know when you're trying to find someone that isn't within the kind of normal categories then it, it takes longer and uh, that is just not something that some businesses I worked with really understood so I made the shift to go Facebook, they are very much about giving people the power to build community. They have a lot of resource groups that really empower people to connect and kind of bounce ideas off each other. So um, they are a strengths based business as well. And very much you're told from day one to bring your authentic self. So I felt very much that me as an individual was going to be supported and, and my differences embraced. So I've also since uh, joining the team, so I, I do that on the recruitment side, which I'll talk about later, but I also so have founded a resource group called uh, Differently Abled. So going back to that, we're not disabled, we're just differently abled. So 
I am the neurodiversity lead, so anything to kind of do with dyslexia and that kind of thing. And what we look to do is support people who are differently abled, whether that's physically, mentally or cognitively and just share lots of things that we as employees use whether it's tools like text expander which is great uh, if you need to write the same kind of emails that really helps you out or um, just just advice that we have in the workplace to support each other brilliant i am a fellow dyslexic so i know about all of the hurdles that i faced in the past um especially when it comes to uh, trying to get a job because um, CVs and yeah written written uh, tasks can be a bit of a barrier so I think it's about how do we influence companies to think innovatively and use digital platforms going forwards. Um, Tanika thank you so much for joining us today so as a young person who's been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis can you tell us a little bit about your journey in finding work and about the barriers that you've faced? Well, for me, I think um, <clears throat> my main barrier was, first of all, with myself, because I was just thinking, how are people going to perceive me now that I have this condition? But then once I got over that, I was like, yeah, I need to just put forth my best self. And so I applied for work and I thought, OK, I've got a degree in social work. But I knew I didn't want to follow that lead at that time, come in straight out of the hospital I just wanted to do something that would have been simple for me to just get my feet wet so I applied for retail however I kept getting knocked back and I was thinking well why is that I didn't understand because I never received any feedback from these companies to say why they didn't want to employ me so I just then assumed that it was because of my um, conditions because I was open and honest and I disclosed my hidden conditions and then this made me feel really upset and I felt disheartened and I was thinking do I even continue to go forth in looking for more work or should I just leave it and that's how I then um, was able to um, get involved with the Prince's Trust and I'm so happy that I did because they accepted me and they saw the ability behind the things that I couldn't see I was good at and uh, I was so grateful for someone to just see me and not say, well, actually, you know, you're not able to have the right um, <laughs> ability to comprehend certain information and you're not going to be able to um, process information as easily as somebody else. And when you go into the working world, you don't have somebody sitting next to you to baby you through every step. So this is something that I had to realize for myself and try and gain that ability and with the prince's trust they did this get into um get into hospital services and i thought well i'm in and out the hospital all the time so why not try and figure out <laughs> how to um give back to the hospital services that were looking after me and so this was something that was really good and i felt like i was moving forward and being able to help other people despite the fact that I had this disability. Such an inspiring um, story Tanika, thank you so much for joining us. I love your confidence and your perseverance and thank you for being an, an amazing young ambassador for the Prince's Trust. So now we've set the scene with our stories, we want to start talking about what are the solutions that companies and recruiters who are listening can do to make a more inclusive workforce for disabled people. So Adam, how do you think that people with a disability can add value to business? So we, we've been talking about, um, you know, it, it all comes down to strengths and weaknesses. And uh, as, as both my um, esteemed colleagues said, disabled people are very resourceful. They're good at hacking. They, they understand that with a disability comes certain challenges that might not be there for a non-disabled person. And so we have to learn to, to work around those. So our thinking is already problem solution orientated. And so that kind of thing in, in a corporate environment 
can be really, really useful. I think a disabled employee on average adds sixty thousand pounds of value to a company's bottom line. So th those are the, the numbers that that we're talking about here. And it, it all comes down to um, being given the equality of opportunity as our, as our non-disabled counterparts. I have no interest in inequality of outcome or quota hires or pity hires or what have you, because that sits everyone up for a fall and helps neither a corporate or a disabled person um, advance a career or, or a brand and, and no one really learns anything. And I think the, the big issue that we have in execution of this is that there are no disabled people in positions of power and influence with, within these companies. And so you've got no one who knows about disability or, or access or language or attitudes making decisions about it. And ultimately it normally ends up with a bunch of able-bodied people discussing what they think they need to do to better equip their companies to hire disabled people, rather than actually going to the audience they're trying to serve and being having a really open, honest conversation saying, hey, what what do we need to do to, to solve this imbalance, to solve this pay gap and this employment gap? Last time I checked the disability employment gap, that's the number of disabled people ready, willing and able to work versus the number who actually are. And and that, that's what really needs to be done. We need to have really open, honest and difficult conversations. And what sets disability apart from it, the other protected characteristics in terms of recruitment is it's the only one that costs money. We can all send an email saying, can we be less sexist on one day? Could we dial back the racism on one day? If we could be less homophobic on one day, that would be great. But you can't look at the stairs on a Friday night and say, if we could be a bit flatter, a bit rampier in the morning, because we've got a, a guy in a wheelchair starting, that would be amazing. It's an area where you've really got to kind of put your money where your mouth is and make physical changes and, and reasonable adjustments to not only your working practices, but also the physical environment. And I think once we get over those those issues and there's government support out there, so the companies don't have to take a hit at all. They just need to apply for funding to do it, which is something that not a lot of people people know about. And so kind of knowledge and understanding are the real superpowers in, in this. So yeah, have honest conversations and, and direct conversations. And I think the language barrier is a real fear there. No one wants to have the conversation for fear of saying what they believe is the wrong thing. And I, I'd rather be slightly offended, but still have a, a real good conversation about it than just everyone sit in awkward silence and nothing change. Love that. Love that. Don't be scared, guys. Keep having those conversations and don't let language be a barrier. And also, please have a look at the government funding that Adam was talking about. Um, Philippa, so you work in recruitment. So what? Uh, why is it important for companies to recruit and champion within this place space? Yeah, I think simply put, the data is there that companies that focus on inclusion outperform their peers. Like, if you don't believe me, there are many studies behind it, but it's it's a fact. And the, the simply also put, the world is not a one size fits all. Every single human being has different needs. And if your business is going to succeed, you're going to need people with different opinions, different experiences, having a seat at that table to help those businesses hiring inclusively you're never going to get that full understanding and I think if you're really serious about being inclusive it also needs to be business as usual um, Adam mentions it there it can't be a little nice to have badge on your or on your website it needs to be ingrained inherently in your recruiting staff your your culture your your stakeholders minds it needs to be embedded everywhere it needs to be a topic that yes might not always be comfortable but a conversation that is always had and it's 
It's about making a purposeful effort to be a progressive organization that has the confidence and the knowledge, even if it's knowledge that you gain over time to realize that there are so many possibilities um, by creating that mindset and creating that kind of process and internal process to be successful in recruitment um, and really kind of gain from that rich pool of diverse talent because um, there is some incredible talent out there as well. So um, we always kind of say it's great to have the intention to do it, but if you don't have the process to do it, you're going to fail. Um, and if you have the process to do it, but not the in intention to do it, you're going to fail as well. So I think when we um, when we think about that at Facebook and even just throughout my recruiting career, Adam Adam mentioned it there. Um, there is a statistic that 80% of people will gain a disability between the ages of 18 to 64, and that is your working population. So don't just think about it as people that you're going to hire. Uh, it's actually going to affect your current working staff as well. So unless you are fully inclusive, you're putting things in place, it is going to affect you as a business, whether you like it or not. So um, we really need to think about how we support employees and you know how you are going to really set people up for success and make use of their superpowers and their kind of different abilities as well. So I, I don't believe that anyone purposely puts uh, barriers or intends to create barriers, but have you really looked at your organization? Have you looked at the application process? Have you looked at the interviews? Uh, have you looked at your onboarding to kind of make that possible. Thank you Adam I don't know or Adam and Philip I don't know what um, what successful initiatives have you seen within the recruitment space or in the work culture um, within corporate companies or in small businesses what which ones have you guys seen that you think would be useful to share with the audience? Well, I, I got into the BBC on their um, disability recruitment scheme where they hire exclusively for disabled candidates on, on six month fixed term contracts. And then as part of that six month contract, they send you off to like with the other successful applicants on the same scheme for, for training and for, for networking events and, and what have you to give you a, a wider perspective of how big corporations such as the BBC work and it, gets, it teaches you how to communicate with people on an executive level and how how best to, to sell yourself. I think particularly when you're fresh out of education you're not quite sure how to sell yourself and you often get it wrong where you either undersell yourself or you really oversell yourself and the expectation and the delivery just don't match up. And it's all about teaching those soft communication skills and soft skills that serve you really, really well in, in a working environment. So I, I thoroughly love that. And quickly, if I could pick up on something that was, that was just said. Again, disability is the only protected characteristic that isn't mutually exclusive. And by that, I mean, I'm not going to go to bed this evening as like a white CV church going male. And wake up tomorrow morning as a as a black lesbian with a partial on for Scientology. But anyone at any point could be God forbid in an accident like skiing, driving, or just slipping in the bathroom and have to suddenly change their life. They, they could end up in a wheelchair even temporarily. And so if you're listening to this and and again, God forbid that should happen to you, how how is your journey to work look now? How does getting to your desk look now? How will the other employees at where you work treat you now? And if you can't answer those questions, ask yourself, A, why not? And then how can you put yourself in a position to be able to answer those questions? Hi. Amazing. Thank you, Adam. I love that about looking at things from a different perspective. Tanika, would you, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you think that um, disabled young people can feel more empowered within the workplace? Could I also just go off the back of what Adam said? Because yeah, of it's course, so go for it. I can fully relate with that because when I got my diagnosis finally, so I was in the hospital for about, I think it was about five months, and um, I was so scared because they kept saying, oh, we're not sure what it is, 
it's probable MS, but they weren't 100% sure. So I had to go through all these different scans and tests for them to make a conclusive diagnosis. And once I got my diagnosis, I was happy, yes, but I also thought, well, what now? What's next for me? Because in the beginning, I couldn't move my eyes. I couldn't open my mouth to speak. I couldn't go to the toilet. I couldn't walk properly. And these were all simple things that I once could do that now was alien to me. And I think that was one of the lowest points in my life because I just thought, why is this happening to me? What have I done wrong? Like, did I do something that I shouldn't have done? Did I have too much fun at university? And maybe I shouldn't have drank so much. Um, <laughs> but I just thought, OK, what now? And I think it's so important to remind yourself that this is not the end. This is not the end. There's medication that can help you and there's support out there that you can have to guide you through this new. It's a new body that you now have to train and you have to control it rather than it control you. So I just had to think like if I'm going to potentially be in a wheelchair one day, I'm going to make it the best wheelchair that you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm going to make it the best walking stick that you've ever seen because those were the things that was my biggest fear. People actually noticing the difference in my abilities. And so I thought I need to embrace it and whatever it is, make it the best. So I just think anyone who's listening to me right now or anyone else on this panel is to definitely have strength and be strong in yourself and always knowing to yourself that you can, you can do anything that you put your mind to. And I'm a strong advocate for that. Amazing. We're getting some um, chat actually in the group saying, love Tanika's story and how strong and driven you are. That's from somebody in the group. So, Tanika, um, I love what you were saying also about controlling, not letting it control you and you're, you're in control of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was a great point. So how, how do you think that um, young disabled people can feel empowered within the workplace? What do you what do you feel that employers can do to ensure that empowerment? I think it's about just having that open conversation with them, asking that employee, what can I do to help you to make you feel more comfortable within the workplace? I think making sure that there are lifts available for people who may not be able to use the stairs, but also have the stairs to not completely ignore the fact that there are people that can use them, but just making sure that there's a balance. I think also to and just simple things like the toilets, making sure there's a disabled toilet. I think that's great. And also having maybe a, a room whereby somebody who maybe um, has a disability, they can go to that room just for a bit of self-reflection or to have something to eat. It'd be great if there's like um, a vending machine with water and nuts that are going to help that person. So I know for me personally, I've never ate so many nuts in my life since I've got MS. <laughs> Brazil nuts, cashew nuts, um, what other nuts do I have? And also making sure that that person who has a disability is acknowledged within that environment, making sure there's training to help that young person and also the staff, the staff and employees need to be trained to know what disabilities are about, both visible and hidden. So they're not completely blindsided and staring at somebody in an awkward way because they're not sure what to say. How do you speak to somebody that has a disability? You don't want to make them feel like you're patronising them because we're human just like everyone else. And I think it's even harder for those who have a hidden disability like myself because people expect more of you because you look normal, whatever normal is these days. But I think for me, when I remember when I came out that someone said to me, um, what's wrong with you? Are you drunk? Why are you walking like that? No, I'm not drunk. I'm off balance. And that's because I have multiple sclerosis. And sometimes it's annoying having to explain your whole life story to somebody. So to have that training in the workplace, I think would be a great awareness for everybody. Amazing. Thank you, Tanika. Um, I know that I've spoken to Adam quite a lot previously um, about how 
the perception of disabled people needs to change. And Tanika, you touched on it in the sense that um, it's not about viewing disabled people with a like you know poor them pity eye. How Adam, how do you feel that we can kind of change that view? I I think that's down to visibility of disability, not just in the workplace, but but everywhere. And we need to pull it away from these these like cliches and tropes that we use of either kind of pity or heroism or particularly for disfigurement, you're either a victim or a villain and there's there's nothing else in between. Certainly in, in films. Like I I I've been like the best yet worst Bond bad guy ever. Best in the sense of I've got the look, worst in the sense of I'm grossly incompetent. And we need we need to kind of take it away from there and, and almost normalize it and teach people how to view not just disability but disabled people as people with a real 360 degree perspective and get over whatever inertia there is, whether it's fear, awkwardness, more often than not, it's unfamiliarity. Um, uh, nine out of 10 people in the UK have never had a disabled person in their house. So that's the level of unfamiliarity that, that we're talking about here. And that's gonna come down again, everything always ties back to communication and sitting down and just thrashing this out and having like a real honest, open, open chat. You will never know what a disabled employee needs until you ask them. So going away and Googling it or playing kind of house MD in, in your head is only going to stress you out and it's not going to serve anyone. So again, just be really honest and, and have the conversation. And if you have questions, like, like ask them. And as long as it's delivered with sensitivity and sincerity, you can't go wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was just going to go ask um, Philippa about dyslexia, actually, because I know that I've <laughs> received within the workplace um, perceptions of people about, you know, dyslexia and how you may be less able. How, yeah, what's your experience with that? And how do you think that companies can create a work culture which empowers um, neurodiverse people? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's an interesting one. I, we always say, as Adam quite rightly said, if, if what you, you don't know what you don't know, and then until you ask people, you're not you're not going to learn. And I think one thing to really stress is that, especially with things like dyslexia, dyslexia affects people in different ways. Like when I, when we talk about the um, the resource group that we have, one of my colleagues um, is dyslexic, and how she functions and how she um, sees challenges and and kind of the solutions that, that she has is completely different to mine. Um, I really need like a lot of bullet points. I need things colour coded. I process information better verbally than I do in, in, in kind of written format, which is extremely hard now that we're all working from home because you don't get to see your colleagues as much so unless I'm having a lot of VC meetings um, it, it's it's difficult and I think uh, the other thing to say is that unless people are self-IDing it's it's really hard to get that information as well to give people that confidence that open space to um, to say that this is this is what I need and so I think it takes it, it takes the a culture and it takes kind of strong management it takes open management and being bold and open to some of our facebook values to get people to say like this is this is what i need and and then their colleagues and their allies embracing that because i think i saw a statistic the other day that 76 percent of students wouldn't inform a potential employer of their disability I didn't put my hand up to say that I was dyslexic when I interviewed um, at Facebook and not because I didn't think it was going to be embraced, but because I just I don't see it as a fine ways of working. And, and despite being in recruitment where you're reading a lot and you're probably writing a lot of emails, I'm, I'm then proudly open to say that I'm dyslexic because I have our, our VP of London is, is proudly dyslexic and has given me the confidence to to talk about it. So um, when I think about the kind of three things that we always talk about uh, within the kind of workspace is 
you need to be accommodating, especially if you're in hiring. Look at your job descriptions. Do you really need excellent written communication skills? in a job that isn't a communication role? Probably not. Um, are you writing the word expert? Because expert for people with autism is far too vague. Like what does expert mean? So think about your languages, think about your accommodations when people are coming in for interviews to make them feel that they're welcome even when they are interviewing. Is it giving them a bit of paper and a pen so they can write things down? Is it giving them a really quiet room because people with ADHD struggle sitting in a cafe if you were to interview them because there's too much noise? Um, and of course, make sure that you're not giving that information to an interviewer because there's data protection. Uh, you shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, giving that information to the interviewer about the individual, but actually set the room up, set the space up to um, give them quiet spaces, give your employees quiet spaces if they struggle with too much noise. Uh, we actually have a whole load of open source training that I really encourage you if you're a business, if you're an ally, if you're an employee to go and look at so you can find them on the Facebook page. So one is managing a respectful workplace, which I think comes back to your question around how do people embrace everyone's different abilities, managing bias. So everyone as an employee has to go through that. So um, training our employees to identify and counteract unconscious bias. Uh, be the ally, so um, picking up on common languages and tools to address that, and then for managers, managing inclusion. So from day one, you're taught that this conversation should be normalised, but it, people should be embraced, and actually there's not an option. Like, you you have to build that community internally, uh, and then there's lots of different things as well within that. Thank you, Philippa. That's some great, absolutely great knowledge, um, nuggets of knowledge there for our listeners to take away. So I just want to wrap up our panel discussion um, before we go on to the Q&A from the audience. So, Adam, we're going to look at, well, all of you actually, what is your one key measurable action that you think that the audience should take away from today? Adam, would you like to go first? Oh, that's a that's a tricky one because when it comes to measurable action, there's a lot of you know how how do we how do we measure it and 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 what have you. Um, I'm gonna say find get get good training in there. We we've heard about things like un unconscious bias, which everyone does by the way. I think unconscious bias is far too often used as a term to beat people over the, over the head with. Well, in actual fact, it refers to the snap judgments we make about people armed with little information, which e even even I do. Even I watch Love Island and just shake my head in disapproval. But I think it's a, a case of teaching people to acknowledge it. And so I'm going to say um, training. Find a, a good kind of training program. I can certainly put you in touch with, with my guys and have as many people do it do it as possible and if you if you equip your workplace and equip your workforce then any dis disabled appointment you do make will be a success thank you thank you adam what about you philippa what's your key action for the audience to take away uh i think targets uh targets 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 they hold people accountable uh, it of course depends where you are as a business so you might think is it a number of events per year we always say that you need to have two touch points to engage with a community is it training completion percentage like pick the right one for you but i think targets and the five main things I think you should focus on. I know it's not one, but it's one as a collective. Um, know where you're at right now and where you're going. That's number one. Um, have company wide targets that are measurable. Keep everyone accountable. Have an audit of your recruitment process and keep auditing. Keep your recruitment and HR accountable as well. Have a senior sponsor that champions it both internal, internally and publicly and train all that that's part of their performance review as well to again hold them accountable because I think without that data and without that number um, it's just going to be an opinion so I think have specific targets that you aim for and yeah educate. Thank you, Thank you. so we've got so far we've got training 
um, target and then Tanika, what is your uh, action for the audience to take away? Oh, they've took all the good ones. <laughs> but I would definitely say training is important, but I think uh, a task for the audience would be after this would be to go and research hidden conditions because we can't see them. I think it's important to know what they are and how they affect people and what are the different um, symptoms of those conditions and how best to work with somebody with a hidden condition. And then you'll be able to have an open conversation in the workplace with somebody about it. And then going forward, hopefully this will create a culture within the workplace of people having the awareness of hidden conditions and how to work alongside somebody that has Brilliant. So thank you, panelists, for your discussion. So the key takeaways are training, targets, research. Those that's the key takeaways from today. Um, so we're gonna go on to some Q and A's from the audience. Um, we've got one that's come in here. They all all anonymous at the moment, nobody's putting their name. Um, but Adam, could you, uh, somebody on what is big question, but take that one. Um, could you repeat the question, please? What is uh, negative language and what is positive language around disability? Okay, uh, language is a, a real sticking point for, for a lot of people and some people prefer kind of person to language, person with a disability, other people go with, like myself, go with disabled person and then some people we use um, differently abled and I don't think, um, and it, this may sound like I'm dodging the question but, but stay, stay with me, um, I don't think there is a, a one size fits all to correct language um, around disability in in the workplace, and I think ultimately common sense should should prevail. And obviously, we we know that there are certain things that you you absolutely can't say, like you wouldn't refer to me as as the upper spastic any more than you tell a female colleague to get back to get back in the kitchen. But I, I, again, I think as long as you're sensitive and and are kind of thinking it through. Then, then ultimately it'll it'll all be okay. So my my answer is is common sense ultimately prevails, and there are also a, a section of, of people that will find offence in everything, and I think the more eggshells that, that we put down for people to trip over, the less likely they're going to be to to go there anyway. So my my overarching advice would be just be be sensible, be sensitive and let common sense do its thing. Brilliant answer. Thank you, Adam. Um, we've got another question come in here um, for Tanika. How do you think we can ensure to champion and support our teams um, in a blended environment? So where some are in the office and when some are walking, working at home? Good question. Um, I think the best way to do that is to ensure that everything is accessible. <clears throat> so like because of this COVID-19 and we're having to do things online. If something, if say for example, a training session is happening in the office, make sure that is being recorded so that somebody who's working from home can see it also. And I think that's a good way to include everybody so that they are able. And also if somebody has a um, hearing impairment, then you've got someone maybe doing sign language also on board. And that will definitely ensure that everyone is included and thought about. We want to know that we're not left out. Thank you. Um, someone's got a question for you, you here, Philippa. Had your uh, VP not openly come out about dyslexia, would you have opened up about your dyslexia? Oh, good question. Um, 
I think I would have done actually. Uh, from memory, the conversation came up because uh, a VP of Instagram was uh, visiting the UK and opened a forum uh, for anyone. It was an, an open invite for the company, so not necessarily if you identified as being differently abled and people were talking about his experiences and actually the forum itself enabled me to kind of talk about it. So I, him definitely in part, but I think there was always the space, as I said before, from orientation, you're taught to be your authentic self, you're taught that everyone has superpowers and I have really supportive management as well. So it's been it's been something that I yeah, it's taken. I've been in recruitment for kind of seven, eight years now. So um, it's taken that amount of time to be in the right environment to talk about it, even though it's been something I've been passionate about. But management has also helped that as well. So I think it's two pronged. My my manager has come up with a fantastic um, document where we as a team have a come to me when and a don't come to me when. Um, so it talks about people's strengths so like come to me when for me you want anything creative done like a presentation because that's my skills but please don't come to me when you want me to spell check something because that will stress me out and I won't be very good at it so I think managers really understanding the differences your team members need whether someone needs something written whether someone needs a, a video call to explain something like really get to know your team and, and how you can enable them um, but have that senior stakeholder that's also kind of giving the wider company a bit of a kind of a lighthouse example of being brave and, and talking about it. Thank you, thank you, Philippa. Adam, I've got two questions here. How how can people find out about your training? Firstly, so with with that, just get hold of me on the old Twitter share, Adam underscore Pearson, and what we can start a dialogue dialogue from there. Brilliant. And then I've got another question. Do you think that the Equality Act is fit for purpose, and are there enough legal protections? to promote disability equality in the workplace? I think when it comes to disability, the Equality Act is a piece of toothless, useless legislation. <laughs> so sorry if that's a bit on the fence for, for anyone. And I also think things like disability competent are, are incredibly unhelpful. Um, I, I'm not interested in competence, I'm interested in competence. And I think there are a lot of companies who have the label disability competent, competent when they're incompetent um, around the area. And I think we need to hold companies to real rigorous account on, on their disability numbers. As I said, only 4% of companies do disability when it comes to diversity, which, which means 96 don't. And it's like saying if you found out tomorrow that 96% of your friends didn't like you. Like that's how a disabled person feels when they're going to any employment situation or trying into any any marketplace and I think again it like real accountability needs to be had there was a case in in America um a, a blind customer um asked Domino's pizza to make their website accessible for him and rather than doing it which would have cost maybe 20 maybe twenty thousand dollars to future proof your website and make it accessible for people with both hearing and visual impairments. Rather than do that, they, they took it to the, the courts in America and lost. And rather than paying that initial $20,000, it cost them in excess of $2 million. And I think that's the, the kind of level of accountability we need to create. And if we're gonna give companies the autonomy to hire and fire as they see fit, autonomy and accountability are inseparable. And so they also need to be held to the same level of accountability and be a lot more transparent in in the process. And um, Tamika said earlier um, that just the real lack of feedback as as to why she wasn't successful in applications. That feedback needs to be there all the time. And if, if it's A, too much effort or B, it means you actually have to say no disabled people. That's a problem. Thank you. Feedback, definitely agree on giving young people um, feedback in the recruitment places is really, really valuable to their progression and also yeah, informs them on how they can do better. So thank you so much um, 
to our amazing panelists. Thank you for the discussions today. Um, very interesting points that you've all made. Um, and thank you to all of our audience um, for the amazing questions at the end. Um, as I said, I said at the beginning, we need to educate ourselves and have open conversations, but we do also need to implement those changes within, um, within our companies. So thank you for your time. If you're currently looking to hire or um, you have any live vacancies, then please do get in touch with the Get Hired, Get Hired team in the Prince's Trust. And if you're a freelancer, a young person or a business and you do want to work with us, then please do reach out to us too. Um, we will send this recording out to everybody on YouTube and we'll put subtitles Enjoy your day and look forward to um, hopefully having you on another live talk. Our next live talk is on the 1st of October and it's Black History Month special celebrating talent. Thank you very much.